Hi, my name's Scott. I write a lot about Christian matters. Um, if you go to my website at uh, www.heartforkingdom, H-E-A-R-T-F-O-R-K-I-N-G-D-O-M.com, um, you'll see a lot of what I write about. Um, this is my first foray into video recording, and um, I'm really trying to sort of make some of the stuff I've written more accessible, not that I think it's necessarily particularly valuable in and of itself, but hopefully you might find it of some use. Um, and in sort of recording this stuff, I'm hopeful that, you know, people might uh, engage with me a little more on some of the things I write. In this article or this, this um, vlog, I want to discuss the pain that we feel when we think that God has refused us some kind of dream that we have. You know, all of us, I think, at different times feel stuck um, in a particular unpleasant or difficult sort of situation. And we think that there might be something more that um, life has to offer for us. And here we are kind of stuck in this spot, doing the same things we've been doing, in my case, for over nine years now. And it's like, oh, OK, I'd like to move on, but I can't. And, you know, sometimes you think you've got an answer from God and then you find, no, it's actually not. You don't actually have that answer from God. I always sort of resonate with Jacob's words in um, Genesis 47 verses 8 to 10 when he's asked how many are the days of the years of your life and he says to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. Wow. I can sometimes feel that, you know. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And at times I feel that way. I think, you know, if you if you have a look on my website, you'll see that, you know, for me, probably the last few years have been a bit too, uh, tumultuous. They're getting better, but, you know, it's been an interesting um, period of time. And, um, one writer that I um, like to read talks about the dark night of the soul where, you know, you feel like you're all alone in this. And I think, I think many people probably resonate with that. Everyone, I think, though, can also look at someone else in their life and say, wow, I don't want their dramas. I've got enough of my own sort of thing. And um, I think that, you know, when we do that, we, we come to realise that, you know, maybe we don't actually have it that bad. Other times we go, you know, gee, you, you seem to have it really easy. What I'd suggest to you is that those people who seem to have it really easy are probably just better at covering up what's going on in their life. Um, not in a bad way, but I just I think that that's probably what goes on. In October 2017, having been a Christian of, I would say, a lot of conviction, and um, but very traditional, um, in a particular sort of form, and um, I've changed out of that particular uh, denomination I'd been really losing my conviction steadily and I was actually honestly at a point of walking away from God altogether it was a pretty tough time um, I'd got plenty of experience of what still seems to me to be direct intervention from God in my life and I was pretty sure that God existed but I couldn't see myself as part of his purpose and I, I just really felt lost and astray and you know um and it wasn't really about unanswered prayer. I actually think that um, I'd asked for certain things and God had specifically responded to those things. Um, and then early in that year, a, an old friend contacted me and he um, convinced me to sign up for a retreat in Victoria, Victoria, Australia, um, later that year. And I signed up, but honestly, I fought every inch of the way. Um, and, you know, one of the worst parts is actually when I got sent... Um, um, John Eldridge's Wild at Heart. I don't know if you've read it. If you haven't, it's probably worth a read if you're a male in particular, because it's designed for men. Um, and it was required reading. Now, anyone who knows anything about me knows I am not an outdoors lumberjack type, right? Let's get this out there right, right from the start. I read, I don't do, okay? Um, and the opening words of John's book talk about climbing a mountain and hunting elk. And I've never hunted anything in my life and I have no interest in hunting. Um, and I actually, I just didn't read more than the first couple of words. I just went, ah, yeah, not for me, put it down and resolved I wasn't going to go. But you know what? The angels had their work cut out, and but they got me there. I, it's a long story. I'm not going to go into it. We haven't got time. But yeah, they got me on a plane. They got me to travel to the retreat, even down to the last day where I, you know, I was really resisting and 
you know, I had this massive bag where I had a full suit for my work that I traveled on. <laughs> and, and I had to try and fit it into this little BMW that the guy was picking me up in one of my friends down there. It just, everything was going wrong, but I got there. And I was captivated very early. Um, I, I, I have issues with John Eldridge. Um, I'll, I'll put that up front, but I tell you what, that book actually introduces or introduced me to a whole new way of thinking that transcended my whole fear of being lost and all of those things. And actually for a period of time, I organized similar retreats up here in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, um, and watched that same effect occur for other men of my acquaintance who were, who were likewise equally with me lost. But I'll tell you what came out of it was that I started to wrestle with what it is that God wants for me in my life. Um, I really wrestled with, um, I think, a feeling of lacking resilience, of being just lost. And I've actually really asked God to help me, right? Um, and to sort of help my, my lack of faith. And for a while there, I actually thought I'd found an answer in a bit of a passion for homelessness. And, and long story short, I nearly became homeless. All right. Um, you can read about that on my website as well. Um, uh, I was after, you know, a, a pretty bad period in which I'd attempted suicide. And there's a lot of stuff that was pretty rough that went on in it. Um, and then... Um, I got through this sort of situation where I got sort of diagnosis of what was wrong with me. I've got complex PTSD, borderline personality vulnerabilities. I'm not going to go into the trauma that created the PTSD, but it, yeah, it goes back to childhood. Um, and it's probably, probably reasonable to suggest that I've got Asperger's. Um, I haven't a formal diagnosis. I've had um, suggestion that uh, from a psychiatrist that it's possible that I do actually have, you know, some form of, uh, you know, being on the autism scale. Um, but the outcome is that I actually really do suffer, uh, stutter or suffer. Uh, I really do suffer um, probably daily almost with hypervigilance, depression, and general anxiety. But yet I still function pretty well. Um, I run, a, I, I'm, I operate in a pretty high uh, level position in my work. And um, I run a number of businesses um, uh, that are, you know, I'm going to struggle through the pandemic, but they're, they're, they're performing these days. But, you know, one of the things that actually happened was in the early months after my attempted suicide in my middle um, 20s, I actually got a check for some back pay um, from workers' compensation. And at the time I was walking near a train station. This is not really reflective of who I am, but it was where I was at at the time. I remember thinking to myself, you know, you could jump on this train and you can disappear into remote Northern Australia, where a lot of people do disappear to, travel to some remote area and just disappear, um, cash out the check somehow, you know, whatever. And that feeling was overwhelming. It was awful. And, um, you know, the reality is the likely outcome is that I would have been homeless, sleeping rough, and probably my mental condition would have deteriorated altogether. And that's how it happens. I've, I've seen this. Um, uh, so I was actually reading up on homeless people in my city um, in preparation for a job that I thought I might get. And um, I could see the path that leads to homelessness in many of the people that I was reading about. And it's a cause I feel strongly about. So. I was actually contacted by a headhunter to encourage me to apply for a role as CEO of a homeless service. Now, my background is actually senior executive roles in health services. So I thought, well, it's a pretty good crossover. And I thought God was showing me what my next step would be. So I prayed, prayed a lot about it. And then I wrote what I think was a great uh, application. I think it was because I actually got an interview and then I was actually one of the four people who was submitted to the board for consideration. I thought, oh, thank you, God, for, you know, answering my prayer, showing me what to do. And yet I didn't progress. Um, instead, they appointed someone else. And that rejection really cut pretty deep. And I thought, oh, you know, I prayed about this. Did I misread this? And then there was another 
sort of similar rejection not that long later. Um, travel for work in Asia, love the place, love the people, um, desired to work there. Um, and also think that, you know, I've got a bit of an issue, I suppose, with fly in, fly out type um, mission workers. I think if you're going to try and do some good work with people, um, you need to kind of embed yourself there. Um, so if you're going to go to Asia for mission work, I, I think you need to, you know, commit to living there for a period of time. And I was excited about this whole thing there where this opportunity might exist to move up there. And then I got a contact. And that person said to me, hey, we're actually really keen on you. We're a top 500 company in the world. Here's an opportunity that might come up. And I'd had a bit of a family emergency at the time and, you know, some significant health challenges for one of my family members. And I was looking after that person and, you know, trying to figure out how can I do this? But I prayed about it and the opportunity sort of had arisen and I'd had a contact saying, hey, look, you you know, would you like to move to Singapore? We've got this opportunity. And I took a few minutes out and I prayed to God for guidance and said, look, you know, should I, how's this going to work? And um, I got a sense that I should go for it. And I was a bit critical of that in myself because, you know, if you want to do something and you pray for it and it says, yes, yeah, you feel like you got a yes, it could be this that you want to go, you know. Anyway, I, I spoke to someone who knew the whole situation with my family and actually worked for that company. And that person gave me some pretty wise and encouraging words and um, long story short, made the application and um, had an interview and everything seemed really positive. And then I would pray and say, God, please, um, I'm feeling like this is dragging on a bit. You know, w w can you help me? Where, where's this at? And I'd get a phone call or I'd get an email or something that sort of suggested that, yeah, this is actually going to happen. And then just out of the blue, three months after I applied, I got a really nice but brief email saying, look, we've considered this long and hard. And for a variety of reasons, we've decided to go another way. I was that close. And yet it went somewhere else. And I thought, like, I've got all these sort of promises, maybe, from God. How does that work? Had I misread the signs? You know what? Even now, with a few years down the track, I don't think I did. I actually think I was going to get the role. But something changed. And God was forced into a position where he had to change his mind. Nothing forces God, I understand that. But circumstances changed, and God changed his mind. Shortly thereafter, COVID-19 happened. That was 2020. And a few th other things have now come into view that would have made this move to Asia completely untenable. Now things are starting to tidy up and it's possible that I can move back to it. I've moved up to Asia, but, you know, it's going to take time and we'll see where God wants me to go. You know, some things are just beyond our understanding. It's frustrating. I can't understand why I seem to be you know, led upon one path only to be stopped at the 11th hour. But God knows the beginning from the end. That's immutable. That's there in Scripture. You can't avoid it. And men have free will. If you don't accept that, though, I can't really help you with this question. But, you know, you can see this in action in Daniel 10, you know, where... Um, um, Michael says that the prince of Persia withstood him for 21 days. Yeah, that's just a fact. It's a fact, right? It's rough. But you know what? The world's not there to be arranged for my short-term gratification. Things happen. And sometimes they need real effort from the angels. And remember that always that the spirit of man naturally opposes God. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Balaam was determined to curse Israel. Judas betrayed his friend. Pilate washed his hands. And sometime toward the end of 2019, the start of 2020, some event occurred. And God in his wisdom said, my primary purpose here for Scott is for him to, you know, eat at the marriage supper of the lamb in due course. And I can't change things to 
but I can certainly make sure that Scott gets through to that time. So on the sidelines, I had to be disappointed for the greater good, whatever that might have been. And it's not an un unanswered prayer. It felt like it at the time. I can tell you, I, I went for a long walk that night and my family was sort of asking questions and I just had no answers and I just felt awful. But it was God's decision for my greater good. I'm not trying to self-aggrandize this. There's no way that, you know, COVID occurred specifically to keep me out of Asia. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that somehow or other, some decision was made that actually meant that COVID occurred. Um, someone cut up a bat or something, whatever it was. And circumstances changed and God said, right, well, free will's been exercised. Scott's greater good is served by him not going to Asia at this time. It's delayed prayer, delayed answer, or it's, a, it's an indefinite no. No, I don't know. And I never will probably know. Um, I may choose to push it and go to Asia and have it be a disaster. Circumstances will be whatever they will be at that time. What I can say is I don't actually have close to an answer as to why God is silent sometimes. Why sometimes we find we have our answered prayer. What I have, I'll give you. God is not capricious. He's not whimsical. His every move is deliberate and intentional. He's unfailingly loving and kind to his people. And there are no gotcha moments with God. But God also works in a paradigm where he allows men and women, men in the generic term, humans, to have free will. People oppose God. He allows them to make that choice. And sometimes those choices impact on other people due to circumstances just totally beyond our control. Sometimes there's no answers, no options, and an unanswered prayer. The first and most important thing to know is that God does have a plan for me, and that plan is quite fluid and dynamic as it weaves its way around my free will. His ultimate plan is for me to live a life of faith that culminates in me being a fit vessel to serve him in the kingdom of God. An unanswered prayer might be just what saves me. So you feel that sting? You feel that hurt when the pain you've prayed, oh, sorry, when a plan that you've prayed about doesn't come to fruition, when you seemingly have unanswered prayer? Well, I would suggest to you that we actually don't have unanswered prayer. It just feels like it sometimes. And that's what I wrestled with the night that I got the email telling me that this job in Singapore wasn't going to happen. Man, it hurt. Wow, it hurt. I was living by faith. I felt that I prayed that God had answered in the affirmative. Had I misread his responses? I don't think so. The question has to be one of faith. Do I really have faith that he is working to make me fit for his kingdom, the kingdom of God, that Jesus is perfecting in me? Truly, that's the biggest issue here. Like I say, I can't answer all of these questions, but I can just simply say to you, you know, if you're praying, here I am, send me. That sending might be to the office instead of to the wilds of Asia. Um, I hope it helps you somewhat to understand this and perhaps, um, you know, gives you some comfort in what can be sometimes a difficult time. Wish you all the very best. Thank you.